our you know lecturer for the day and you know she's talking around the whole uh, area of iconic species uh, we grew up admiring these lovely koala bears and you know some of us would have had these around as you know uh, when we were kids and so you know this is a creature which has captured our hearts and imaginations but there's nothing like hearing it uh, first hand hearing the stories first hand uh, lovingly as they might be uh, they are a species and species have their space and a particular role in different ecosystems so we are going to talk about what happens when potentially that balance can get uh, disrupted changed a little bit i don't know dr desley wilson is going to talk to us on that and she's the expert not me but let me do the honors um desley is a terrestrial wildlife ecologist i'm going to ask her desley to talk a little bit more about that lovely title that you used there and she's also senior lecturer in wildlife and conservation biology at deakin university Uh, so she's conducted applied research that seeks to inform management of wildlife species particularly those involved in human wildlife conflicts she has conducted research on overabundant native species and their management in mexico north america and australia and australia as we know has had many many species over its history being brought into the country introduced and you know that the dynamics between what's native and what's not is probably almost a forgotten topic now so it's 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 been very complex to navigate that and we you know i'm i'm sure we are going to hear some interesting stories uh, she's been doing a lot of work on uh, understanding the ecology and behavior of high de- of the high density koala population i think it was 2004 that she began this work i i did some research desley and i saw that you've been doing work on mongoose rats Uh, pocket gopher so so she's been studying some wonderful species and i think uh, while we are here to talk about the koala lens please feel free to widen that perspective and you know bring all that rich insight that you have uh, i know you serve on many many expert panels and you advise government on koala management uh, we are having a government we are having lots of people who can give advice sometimes the advice is not taken too well or not heard so i would like you to also share Uh, how you've been successful in getting your voice heard in government because that's one of the big challenges we have so on that note leslie i'm going to shut up uh, let me hand you over to you over to you for concluding the session uh, and by way of introduction i'm sriyan i used to be the president of the wildlife society here until a few months ago and uh, uh, on many occasions i tend to host this talk so leslie welcome to our show lovely to have you and uh, thank you for joining us please all yours it's it's wonderful to be here and thank you for that lovely introduction and on the point of um being successful in advising government i'm not always sure that i am so i think we're we're all in the same boat on that aspect um so if i can go ahead and share my screen let me get this going So hopefully you can see that yep. now. That's great. Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks again for the opportunity to um be with you tonight and to share some thoughts on human wildlife conflicts and in particular one of the interesting issues that we have with koalas in Australia. So let me get this moving. So worldwide there's so many conflicts between people and wildlife and they seem to be on the increase and for the most part a lot of these conflicts go unnoticed because they involve species that people consider unimportant like some of our rodents and species that people just simply don't really have any feeling for but as soon as an iconic species is involved people pay attention and that adds another dimension in trying to manage the conflict and there's so many issues worldwide including deer in North America issues with elephants as i know you have in Sri Lanka issues with apex predators like wolves leopards and of course some other more interesting ones like with macaques so why do these conflicts arise well with human populations increasing and modifying landscapes 
wildlife are forced into smaller and smaller patches of habitat that may not be sufficient to sustain them. Not only that, but fragmentation of those patches means that animals are moving across human occupied areas and coming into contact with people more and more. Humans and wildlife are using the same resources. Animals might be taking advantage of resources provided by humans and threaten people and their livelihoods. There might be changes in behavior. For example, macaques that are being fed by humans might become more bold and aggressive and resulting in attacks on people. Or in some cases, landscape modification might favor some species resulting in population increases or um, those increases in abundance might also be due to the success of some of um, our conservation actions like stopping hunting or suppressing threats like bushfire. So how do we deal with these conflicts? Ideally, we need to implement a scientifically based management strategy. And these strategies should take a holistic view of the conflicts they consider why the problem arose and all of the consequences of letting that problem continue. They review all possible management options and how they might be integrated into a long-term effective strategy. They consider animal welfare and they also consider cost effectiveness. So the cost of implementing the management should at least be weighed by the benefits of um, doing that management. However, when the conflict involves an iconic species, management strategies are rarely found to be acceptable to the general public. We, there may be protests about control methods, there might be a lot of heated debate in the news and on social media. We can usually count on some protests by animal rights groups. And in the last decade, we've seen the rise of the compassionate conservation movement, which generally disagrees with any active management of wildlife. So as a result, a lot of our management strategies then become more driven by emotion and perceptions rather than science. And I've called these emotion-based management strategies. There may be little consideration of how the conflict has actually arisen. There's poor understanding of the outcomes of not managing the conflict, or perhaps the consequences of managing it ineffectively. There might be calls to um, let nature take care of itself, or people should learn to live with the conflict. It's not the animal's fault. There's all sorts of things that we hear when we enter into these emotive arguments. Only one aspect of the problem might be addressed. For example, we might be able to stop impacts on people, but perhaps the animals aren't taken into consideration, or it might be the other way around. There's often a demand for methods that are perceived to have a good animal welfare outcome, but perhaps these aren't particularly welfare sensitive at all. And sometimes there's simply unrealistic timelines. We often hear the calls to, we should just be creating more habitat, but there's no recognition of the fact that it might take decades for that to actually um, happen. You know, trees take a long time to grow if we're trying to create forest habitats for wildlife. So we can't ignore the human dimension in wildlife management. Doing that can actually have some really significant costs. But what we can do is try to inject some science into management and try to develop management strategies that resolve the conflict, achieve our conservation goals and keep people happy at the same time. And there's lots of methods that we can use like translocation, fertility control, biocontrol, so managing habitats or introducing predators or disease, or perhaps other methods like exclusion or, rep or repellents. Regardless of what we use, there's three primary questions that I think we need to answer before implementing a management strategy. We need to know if it's going to be effective and if it's actually going to be cost effective. Will it have good animal welfare outcomes or are those outcomes just perceived? 
Will there be any negative consequences of doing management? And if so, are these tolerable? For example, are there flow on effects like translocating a problem somewhere else or introducing disease into a new, a new location? So I want you to keep these questions in mind as we look at some conflicts that we have with koalas in Australia. And many of you might be surprised to hear that we actually do have conflicts with koalas, but we do and they're really difficult to deal with, primarily because of the iconic nature of the species. It's a species that generates a lot of tourism dollars. Anyone famous coming to Australia is usually photographed with one, and they're often used to promote conservation or used in funding campaigns like what we saw last year after our severe fires. Although koalas weren't the, the most impacted species of all, they were the ones that we often saw on, on social media. So before we get to the conflicts, we first need to understand a little bit about koalas. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson and a little bit of a, a biology lesson as well. So the koala is a forest dependent species that occurs in eucalyptus forest down the east coast of Australia. So we can see its historic range and what we think its current range is here on this map. It feeds on the foliage of eucalyptus trees. And although there's 700 or more species of eucalyptus tree in Australia, many of those aren't palatable to koalas due to the high levels of toxins and low level of nutrients. So this actually means that koalas have a pretty patchy distribution. There's some forests from which they're completely absent and others where they might only occur in, in low numbers. Climate also plays a role in the distribution of koalas. Koalas don't do very well with hot temperatures or areas prone to drought, which means they're missing from our arid interior. And what we're seeing of late is that ranges are contracting towards the coast. And of course, this is where our greatest human populations occur. So it results in quite a lot of conflicts um, right throughout their range. So although it's a single species, there is a lot of variation in appearance of koalas from north to south. In the north, they're quite small. Females weigh about five kilograms on average, males eight kilograms. They're quite light gray and they have short fur. Down here in the south, we breed them big. Eight and a half kilos is the average for females, 12 kilograms for males. They're quite dark in color and they have very thick, dense fur. And this enables them to cope with the cooler conditions that we have down here in the south. So koalas are marsupials. This means they give birth to underdeveloped young. Those young move to the mother's pouch. This is a, a photo of the inside of a pouch with twins, which are very rare. Uh, they stay in the mother's pouch for drinking milk for about six months, after which they start venturing outside. And by about a year of age, they're at this size. And this one's about ready to leave home and become independent. So they feed on eucalyptus foliage. It's not a very good um, source of energy. So koalas do rest for a large part of the day and they're conserving energy as well as processing the toxins that are in their food. Mostly active at night and recent research has shown that they have a microbiome that's adapted to the eucalyptus species that they've grown up eating. So it's very difficult for a koala feeding on one species of eucalyptus to switch to another food source. And that's really important to remember when we start thinking about management. They have a, an average lifespan of about 12 years. They have very few predators. They occur at really low population densities, but they're well able to communicate with each other. The males have this very loud bellow that carries quite away, and it, it tells other males to stay away and is also for the purpose of attracting females. And this is what it sounds like. So it can carry for quite some distance and it can be quite shocking to hear in the middle of the night. So in terms of the koala's history, um, when Europeans first settled Australia, 
they actually didn't even see koalas for about 10 years. So koalas occurred at fairly low densities during the early 1800s. By the time we got into the 1850s, population seemed to be increasing, and this may have been due to the suppression of hunting by Indigenous people. By 1900, um, koalas were, had been recognised by Europeans as having very nice fur, and there was very intensive hunting, which drove populations almost to extinction. If it hadn't been for some koalas being relocated to islands for protection, we may not have many koalas around today. By the 1950s, um, legislation had been introduced to stop hunting and those island populations were used to restock large parts of the mainland where they disappeared from. Today, our populations of koalas are highly variable and there's a lot of concern that they're actually going to disappear from some areas. They face a lot of threats. The key one, of course, is habitat loss because they're a forest dependent species, but things like fire and storms, disease and urbanization also take their toll. On top of this, of course, we have climate change, which compounds these other threats. So it forces koalas to move towards the coastal area, placing them in urban areas where they're more prone to attack by um, dogs and being hit by cars, and they become more stressed and more prone to disease. So it's um, some really significant issues facing the koala. These threats tend to be more pervasive in the northern part of their range, and that's that area that shaded green on this map. So we're talking the states of New South Wales and Queensland. As a result, populations seem to be declining in those regions and contracting towards the coast. So in Queensland, it's thought that there's probably around 79,000 koalas and es experts estimate there's been a 53% decline in population since European settlement. In New South Wales, it's much of the same story, a decline in populations with only about 36,000 koalas. But down here in the South, in Victoria and South Australia, we've got different issues. So Victoria, recent estimates are that we have 413,000 koalas in our state alone. In South Australia, the estimate's about 114,000. And by all indications, they're probably increasing in number in both states. So this creates a lot of dilemmas in terms of how we go about managing them. So in 2011, as a result of those declines in populations in New South Wales and Queensland, a Senate inquiry found that the koala in the north at least should be listed as vulnerable. And they drew the line at the Victorian border and said anything south of this point, we're not going to include in this listing. So koalas are only considered under state listings where they're considered similarly to any other, any other native wildlife that we have. So, at the moment, the listing for those northern populations is under review, and it's quite likely that we will see in the near future the koala in the north being listed as an endangered species. Here in the south is where we have most of our conflicts, though, just because we've got so many koalas in such a small amount of habitat. So koalas historically occurred, you can see this light gray area on my screen. I hope this was their native or historic distribution, but they were pretty much eliminated on the mainland by hunting during the early 1900s. Some island populations had been established prior to that point. And we've only recently found that there was probably a remnant population surviving in this area we call South Gippsland. So once legislation was introduced to stop hunting, koalas were relocated to other conservation populations or, or locations where they could be conserved. And from there, those koalas were used to repopulate the rest of the state. Not only that, koalas were taken from French Island and put 
on Kangaroo Island. Um, they thrived there. They were moved about on Kangaroo Island. And from there, those koalas were then used to establish populations on the mainland outside of what their historic range had once been. So really considering this, this is a, a remarkable story of successful conservation. We brought a species that was on the brink of extinction back and re-established it and also managed to expand its, its range as well. However, there's been a few consequences of this action. Firstly, we have very low genetic diversity given the genetic bottleneck that the koalas have gone through here in the South. And we've also managed to establish them in some not suitable locations. So for example, we have them in urban areas where they're prone to attacks by dogs or getting hit by cars. We've also established them on a lot of offshore coastal islands. And we also have established them on some mainland islands of habitat where there's little opportunity for koalas to disperse from those areas. So we do have issues with overabundance. Where koalas have been placed in those islands, they've got no opportunity to disperse and they become overabundant. There's also some other unique situations where they become overabundant too. We also have some issues with commercial blue gum plantations, which um, went through some massive establishment in the early 2000s. And it was great because they provided habitat for koalas, but 14 years later, those plantations are being harvested. And so what to do with koalas that are occupying those plantations, leaving the trees that they're sitting in is, has been one solution, but those koalas that are um, you know, forced out of these areas then have to find somewhere else to live. So massive conflicts with blue gums. I'm gonna focus on the overabundance issues tonight just for, um, um, for time, but I'm happy to talk about any of the issues with blue gum plantations as well. So overabundance, as I said, often occurs on these islands of habitat, but they also tend to occur where we have this tree called the managum, Eucalyptus viminalis. It's one of the best trees for koalas. It's um, got high nitrogen levels relative to other uh, eucalyptus species. And it tends to grow in a little bit of a, a monoculture. So um, koalas have a high availability of a good food source in a small area. So where these issues occur from east to west, we've got the island populations, Raymond Island, Snake Island, French Island. Cape Otway is a mainland location where we have some issues. Tower Hill, Framlingham, Budge Bim. And in, in South Australia, there's issues in the Mount Lofty Ranges as well as on Kangaroo Island. So lots of cases of overabundance and probably some looming ones as well that aren't listed there. Our issues with blue gums are mostly in the southwest of the state, but there's a few other areas as well where we're starting to see some issues now as well. So to give you an idea about what happens when overabundance occurs, I'm going to use the example of Cape Otway, where there was no management of koalas. So koalas were introduced there in the 1980s into about 450 hectares of menegum, and that's that light green shaded area here. And it's important to note that while this area here is just menegum, there's suitable koala habitat over here in the Great Otway National Park, but probably not as palatable or as preferred as what Manigum is. By 2008, when I first visited the Cape, there were about 10 koalas per hectare. And this is about 10 times what is considered normal for koalas. However, there didn't seem to be any negative impacts of those koalas on the trees. There might've been a few dead trees, a few defoliated trees, but in general, the habitat was looking quite good. So 
I started some research there with some students at Deakin University to try to better understand the ecology of these high density populations, because there's very little that we actually know about koalas in these types of situations. So we started a, a monitoring program for koalas and tree condition, did some studies of home range and movements, a whole suite of behavioral studies, looking at communication of koalas, breeding ecology, activity, and so on. And we also did a study to see what the impacts of canopy defoliation might be on birds occupying those woodlands. So we'll have a look at the data from the monitoring program and home range, because I think this really starts highlighting some of the issues associated with these, these populations. So for home range, we radio collared a lot of koalas, um, I think 40 koalas over a period of four years and um, tracked them regularly. Some were um, fitted with GPSs. And what we found was these koalas have incredibly small ranges and very high fidelity to those small ranges. So for males, we found that they had ranges averaging about one hectare. And this diagram, this map here shows one koala and three successive seasons of monitoring it. So you can see that he's really not moving far out of this small area. Females, smaller again, we expected this. Females generally have smaller ranges um, under a hectare in size. And again, that high fidelity. So to give you an idea about what we normally see for koalas, we're talking ranges that start at around 10 hectares. Um, so these are incredibly small. And what it means is these koalas are, are very close, in close proximity to each other. They seem to tolerate each other quite well, which is quite unusual for koalas. So perhaps that's something to do with genetic diversity low genetic diversity, is it affecting behavior? These are questions that we still don't have really good answers for. Regardless, what this, this meant was that this population occurred at a high density and it continued at about 10 koalas per hectare up until 2011. It didn't, it wasn't because koalas weren't breeding this or that it, there was high mortality. It was simply because we had resident koalas and the sub adults would disperse outside of the area. In 2012, we started to see an increase, possibly as a result of trees dying to the south of the sites. And by September 2013, we were at nearly 20 koalas per hectare. So 20 times what is considered sustainable um, for koala populations. And I estimated there were probably around 5,000 koalas throughout that Menegum area. So of course, this had some consequences for the trees. In 2008, trees were looking pretty healthy. That continued to 2009. And then suddenly we started seeing these trees struggle to produce leaf and to have healthy canopies. So this we, we scored trees on a, a scale of one to five, three, four and five were relatively healthy canopies, anything less than that wasn't. So by 2013, about 10% of our trees in that 450 hectare area had some kind of healthy canopy. And our trees were looking like this. On just to give you an idea about what this looked like on a bigger scale, we had a sea of dead trees. Anything green in this photo here is a tree that koalas don't like to eat. We had congregations of 20, 30, 40 koalas per tree if that tree had leaves on. Koalas were struggling to pick the last leaf off a tree and in some cases resorting to stripping the bark of trees. It was not a great time to be um, a researcher at Cape Otway because this was absolutely devastating to witness. And you know, trees were struggling to put on leaf. And as fast as they produced a leaf, there'd be a hungry koala tearing that leaf off. So, this is what we were at in, in 2013, 5,000 koalas, poor condition. 
that changed quite quickly. So within about two months, koalas just literally were dripping from the trees. They were, were dying from starvation. It was at this point in the middle of that crisis that our government intervened with what we call a, what they called a welfare intervention. So they sent in a team of vets to um, euthanize any koalas that were found to be in irreversibly poor condition. And you might ask why nothing had been done before it got to that point. And that's actually a really good question. And I actually don't know what the answer is to that. They knew about the situation. They had heard about it a lot from me, from local landholders, but had chose not to um, intervene. So of course, even though this intervention was done on compassionate uh, welfare grounds, there was significant backlash from the international community about what had happened. And it was um, portrayed as being a government conspiracy to cull koalas because um, to try to control their overabundance. That certainly wasn't the case. It was done on welfare grounds only. So that's what happens if we let one of these situations run its course. So how can we stop these types of situations occurring? How can we manage koala overabundance? And it's really difficult. Koalas are an iconic species. So anything we do with koalas is scrutinized. They are vulnerable in part of its range. So this adds to some complexity because people get very confused about um, are koalas declining or are they increasing? What's the story? So management tools like fertility control and translocation are generally used. And it's these tools that the government invests primarily in. They don't invest in things like habitat management, planting trees, or things like protecting um, individual trees from, um, from koalas. These things are left up to landholders to do at their own expense. So fertility control and translocation, they sound fantastic, sound like they should be good, but they're really, really difficult um, methods to actually implement and especially over large scales. They involve capture of koalas. Often because our koalas are sitting high in the treetops, we need trained climbers to get close to them. Those climbers will then wave flags on the, the end of extendable poles that might be up to 10 meters long to try to get the koala to move down the tree to a point where we can put a noose um, around its neck. It's got a stop knot, so it's not gonna strangle the koala. And that rope is then used to stop the koala getting away from us. So to give you an idea about what it looks like in action, there's our koala sitting high in the treetop there, um, not interested in too much until it sees that flag, takes a little bit for us to get his attention. And then suddenly that very quiet animal moves quite quickly down the tree. And it's up to us to try to guide that koala and um, make it come all the way down the tree and not simply run about in the treetops. So it takes quite a bit to get to that point. It's really hard. It can take an hour per koala. Sometimes we have to call the catches off because the the koala gets away from us, sometimes it's not possible to even get close to the koala in the first place. Then once the koala is caught, it's taken to a vet, it's given a hormone implant, or in some cases, um, we have used surgical sterilization. If it's going to be translocated, it may need a flight on a plane, a trip on a boat, or a trip in a trailer behind a car to get it to a suitable site. There's, and then eventually it gets released at that site. So lots of difficulties involved in this program. So, but there's two of these programs that have been running for quite some time. One in Budge Bim in the Southwest of Victoria and another on Kangaroo, Kangaroo Island that's been running since 1997. And I played a role in managing that program um, from 2004. And so this is the program I thought we'd have a, um, a look at today. So there's also a lot of ad hoc programs 
most of these programs don't get monitored. So we really don't have much idea about the outcomes, um, especially in terms of the welfare of the koalas that are involved in that, as well as whether it's actually improved tree condition at the site. So if you remember at the beginning, I said there should be three questions we consider when we're looking at a wildlife management program. We need to consider, is the strategy going to be effective? Is it going to be cost effective? At what kind of timing, over what scales? Will it have good animal welfare outcomes? And will it have any negative consequences that we need to consider as to whether we should continue with this management approach? So we're going to take a look at each of these for koalas. Are fertility control and translocation effective as a management strategy? So we're going to look at Kangaroo Island and koalas were relocated there in the um, in the early 1900s, by the 1950s, damage had first been seen, but it wasn't until 1996 that a decision was made to manage the population. So after a lot of consideration and consultation with experts, a program of fertility control with some translocation was implemented. A monitoring program was also set up so that they could monitor the outcomes of the program and determine whether this was actually a good approach to managing the problem. So Kangaroo Island's a 440,000 hectare island, so it's quite a large island, and but there's not much of that area that is actually great for koalas. So this gives you an idea about um, distribution of habitat. So the high quality habitat is illustrated in red, medium quality in orange, and low quality where koalas can occur, but at low densities in yellow. So it's really, it was really only these high quality habitats that um, they were concerned about at the time of implementing this program. It was estimated that there are around 27,000 koalas on the island. However, a large proportion of that was occurring at about one koala per hectare in this low, or less than one koala per hectare in that low density habitat or low quality habitat. This was the area, the Signet River Valley was the area where most management, management was concentrated. Each of those yellow dots on that map represents a location where a koala was caught. So it gives you an idea about the distribution of koalas on the island and the management. So from 1997 to 2007, about 10,000 koalas were sterilized. About 2,000 were translocated. Most of those were translocated in the early years of the program. And this ran at about a cost of about 8 million. It's very difficult to put an exact cost on the program because it was a program that was part of a, a larger conservation um, program for the island. So there was sharing of staff and revegetation efforts and all sorts of things between programs. So in terms of the effectiveness, the program actually did achieve what it set out to. It reduced the density of koalas in um, the high quality area. And in the first year when translocation was implemented, the, the decline was actually quite steep. However, it, some modeling has shown that it really took 10 years of intensive effort before tree condition was able to improve. So it took driving the density of koalas to below one koala per hectare before damaged trees could actually start recovering. There was immigration into that treated area and there was also compensatory breeding. So more females were breeding when the density started declining. So here you can see um, this is immigration of males and the red immigration of females into the treated areas. So it took a lot of effort for this program to actually work. So a number of recommendations from this analysis is that at least 60% of females must be sterilized to achieve and maintain a decline in the population density. And of course, being an open 
um, population, ongoing management is needed to deal with the immigration into those um, high quality food areas. So the question is, is it effective? Yes, it is. Um, it's effective on over at least 750 hectares as on Kangaroo Island where we're, we're protecting that high quality habitat. It might be effective over larger areas. However, it really should be proactive. Otherwise, it's going to take a long, long time to be able to reverse the impacts on trees. It requires ongoing management and it's actually quite an expensive program. And there's questions remaining about, is this cost effective? And I think we really need to do some economic analysis there to determine whether this approach is. So for the case of Cape Otway, had this type of program been implemented at an early point, far before that crisis had developed, it may have actually been effective and we wouldn't have so many dead menagum at Cape Otway today. So the next question, animal welfare outcomes. Are they good? Are they bad? What do we know about those? So research on Kangaroo Island suggests that fertility control um, is it does have good outcomes for animals, although we did find, my, my student um, found that any koala that had been surgically sterilized tended to move more from its home range. So we suspect that because these koalas were still undergoing estrus cycles, that they were wandering off in search of males that might potentially make them pregnant. Certainly our hormone implanted koalas that shut down their estrus cycles, they didn't wander off whatsoever. They, they had similar movement patterns to our control group. However, we found that sterilized females were in better condition than fertile females. So removing that burden of having a joey with them actually meant that um, they didn't have those same energetic costs. So uh, were in better condition. But of course, this can potentially le lead to females living for a lot longer as well. In terms of translocation, there's been a number of studies of translocation and highly variable um, success rates of that. So we found from Kangaroo Island that about 12% of koalas died within the first three months of translocation. These were radio collared koalas. And in other studies, um, up to 90% mortality has occurred. It appears to be highly dependent upon the suitability of the release site. Are there similar tree species? Are there trees that the koala's microbiome is adapted for? And what are the weather conditions at the time of release? So when released, when it's very cold, um, koalas are spending a lot of energy trying to stay warm, so um, potentially suffering more under those types of conditions. We also found that koalas tend to, translocated koalas move a lot. They move away from their release sites. So over a period of time, we found koalas gradually moved away to the point where some were in about nine and a half kilometers from the original release site. So of course, this has implications for the selection of a release site. We need a site that's you know, well connected with other habitats so that koalas aren't forced to move across long or large areas of open ground. There's also a potential for disease transmission, both um, koalas that are being translocated, taking disease to naive populations, as well as the other way around. So issues there that do need to be considered as part of management. So other potential consequences of taking this approach, well, we know it's slow acting. So the impacts continue over a period of time. And we suspect this leads to a lot of frustration in landholders who are gradually, you know, watching their trees die. And we certainly don't want landholders taking um, action themselves and trying to manage um, these, these animals. So in terms of, can we actually manage koala overabundance? I think the answer to that is yes, we can. In some situations, we 
need to be proactive in undertaking that management. And this possibly is one of the biggest challenges for our government. We need to have translocation sites that are suitable. Um, and that is also another challenge because across the Koalas range or across Victoria, most suitable sites are already occupied by, um, by populations. It does require long-term commitment, which again, another big challenge there, and also requires a lot of funding to support these programs. What we don't have is a master plan. So we know that these, these methods will work, but we don't have any guidance on when they should be implemented and when they shouldn't be. And we need to consider scale and cost effectiveness in that. There's no efforts to really think about landscape scale management. So a lot of our landscapes look like this, not many trees, not much connectivity of habitat. So if koalas attempt to disperse, they're not likely to be successful in that. So often landscape scale management is left to our hardworking grassroots organizations. So some of our not-for-profit um, groups or community groups. And you can see just from these photos, there's lots of appetite for tree planting. Um, and there really should be more support for these types of actions. There's not much consideration of genetic diversity in all of this as well. We need to think about what the future of our populations might be. Low genetic diversity tends to, they tend to be um, populations that have the potential to crash very quickly. And also some of our low density populations could be silently disappearing because all of the attention is focused on these um, overabundance issues. So what lessons can we learn for other human wildlife conflicts from this? Many of these conflicts that arise obviously don't have clear or easy solutions. So we need to be innovative. We need to be constantly thinking about how else we might be able to address some of these issues. We do need to have science to inform management actions. We don't wanna be managing for the sake of managing if that management isn't going to work. We need to monitor and report outcomes of management and we need to take an adaptive approach. Let's use the results of that monitoring to guide future management. Let's learn from um, any actions we take. And finally, I think it's incumbent on all of us to raise awareness and provide facts in what can sometimes be emotive debates. Thank you so much for listening. All right, thank you, Destiny. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, I can hear you. Excellent, that's great. So that was a you know fascinating journey. Thank you for you know spreading it out so vividly. Um, I have a couple of questions which are you know coming from some of the background work as well as stemming from some of what you raised and you know a couple of audience questions coming. So I'm going to kind of mix and match them and hope that's okay with you. Um, so when we talk of the kind of intervention and the timelines you described, uh, I'm guessing we it seemed like about a 15 year period between when the story starts and when we know, you know, how it's going to play out, right? So, exactly. Yeah, so, so for my first question is, uh, you know, is there any backup plan in a scenario that you want to make 60% of a species uh, sterilized. And then we are looking at the journey 10 years, 15 years down the line. So how, how did you all envision that journey? Yeah, and I should point out that the monitoring program on Kangaroo Island was constantly reviewed. So we reviewed our results on an annual basis. So there were sites where we would um, look to see whether trees were improving in condition, whether koala densities were declining. So um, we could tell on the ground that things appeared to be working and which gave us um, confidence to continue with the management. Yep. 
great. It's, 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 it's a high stakes gamble in a sense and a high it cost. It definitely gamble. is. Yeah, it definitely is. And to be honest, I'm not sure what other options there would have been on Kangaroo Island other than to just let it go. Yeah. Uh, Kangaroo Island had some uh, fires a couple of years ago, and that was a you know tough situation. Uh, how did it impact this journey and the program and the work you were doing there? Okay, so the, the fires at the beginning of last year had a devastating impact on the program on the, the population or and on Kangaroo Island as a whole. About two thirds of the koala population probably died in those fires. Yeah. Um, a number of things had happened in recent years, though, that had resulted in management being suspended. So I talked about blue gum plantations being an issue on the mainland there's blue gum plantations on Kangaroo Island. So um, in 2015, it was estimated that the population of koalas on the island had probably doubled as a result of those plantations because management wasn't happening in those. So at that point in time, it was decided that the overall program would cease and there would just be some concentrated efforts in particularly valuable locations. So just kind of spot control rather than that broad scale approach. So yes, you can see that there can be massive investment in a program and it just takes something like, well, blue gum plantations and then ultimately a fire to undo all of that work. Well, um, linking from that, has, has there been any I mean, we, we, we have, you know, uh, the, like you said, there are iconic species all over the world facing challenge. Has there been any modeling or that kind of thing done which can be used to kind of help other researchers trying to manage other species uh, kind of use that to say, this is the right time for an intervention before it becomes the problem that you outlined? Any analytical stuff or AI is coming in to help? Yeah, definitely. And, and I'm not a statistician, but I can say that there is a, a big increase in interest in the use of developing models to try to understand and predict these types of situations. And also then take what we know from programs like Kangaroo Island to then model um, what happens under different management scenarios. Yeah. I mean, in this case, uh, you were dealing with an iconic species which was having an overpopulation scenario. It's normally the other way, right? Uh, well, I, I, I must confess, I do know of one iconic species who's having that same totally disruptive impact on uh, the environment. I think it's called Homo sapiens or something like that. <laughs> and uh, maybe they need some of this intervention. But outside of that, would you know of any other iconic species who have this scenario where they are erring more on the overpopulation side or do we normally find it in the other side of the equation? It it's normally on the other side of things. There are species that are increasing in abundance. So there's some species of deer that, you know, conservation efforts to try to, you know, bring them back from extinction, but then, you know, suddenly they've gone the other direction. And it's very difficult to kind of suddenly reverse your message mm -hmm. about what needs to be done about that population. You know, we have issues with crocodiles. Crocodiles once were on our endangered species list, and now there's um, lots of conflicts with crocodiles in the north. Um, and, you know, they're, they're a relatively iconic species. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so let's say if I just bring it into the Sri Lankan context, um, you know, we have the leopards, the elephants, you know, these are probably the two big iconics who are, you know, at the center of a lot of these conversations and uh, conflicts. But they have the added element of being dangerous to people and, you know, in, in their own right and all of that. So I have a question asking, you know, 
how how does all this change when it comes to you know conflict management when you add that dangerous word into the equation i think it adds an extra level of difficulty and i think it then creates some real problems in terms of trying to manage all aspects of that conflict so trying to protect people and but also trying to protect the elephants themselves and very difficult situations so what, what, what could we draw out from your work if we were to try to take one or two of the i mean you, you brought i'll talk a little bit about the emotive debate a little later but any top of the mind uh, suggestions or commonalities you think would apply to these other scenarios i think you know one of one of the main points is to not have reactive management that doesn't have any scientific basis so there's often a push just to do something for the sake of doing something and i think that's the worst approach to take you need to do something that has been in, at least informed by science or has a likelihood of working and to monitor the effectiveness of that as um uh, if I shift the topic to the marine side, if you don't mind, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, spotlights on the great whites and things like that, right? And they are in their own right and apex uh, in that space. So, you know, how, how do you guys get about trying to convince people to protect those species? It's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. And, and that's a, a really good example. Um, so every time somebody is attacked by a shark, there's calls to cull sharks. And, but I think our media is doing a, a better job of late of trying to provide some facts into that debate and say, well, hang on a second, this is why we shouldn't just go out and kill sharks. Um, you know, for, for all of these reasons. So putting some fact into that debate, putting some science into it, I think is going to have better outcomes. And of course, there's all sorts of approaches for trying to um, reduce um, shark attacks. And one of those is simply uh, surveillance. So we're using drones more and more to actually keep surveillance up and get people out of the water when sharks are, are detected. Well, um, I, I have a question on the comms side, but let me pick up from the drones. And, you know, so you were talking of the $8 million investment in this program as well. Now, you know, typically in a more developed country, you'd have more access to funding and resourcing. I know it has its challenges still, but it, it's ironic that lots of the, you know, special species of the world are still left in the underdeveloped parts of the world. So how does this whole economic equation work if we are to try to conserve some of the really special species in a low economic environment or low, low, you know, low cap, lower capitalized approaches? Uh, are we ever going to succeed? I would hope that there would be success. Um, maybe, you know, given the, that they're iconic species, perhaps ecotourism, may play a role in the conservation of the species, um, you know, gain something from those species um, in terms of um, finances to help fund their conservation and deal with some of the issues. Yeah. Just and, a uh, thought off the top of my head. Um, you no, know, no, that's, that's, that's what the talk is, all, what the session like this is all about. So we're putting in your spot, you in a spot all the time. Uh, well, uh, I, I must confess, COVID has done us in on that one, because uh, we, we, you know, we were a country which had a decent dependency on tourism as well, and you know, if there was any hope of uh, channeling some funding into that, that dynamic is changing as well as we know. Uh, is COVID having any impact on the conservation efforts, not just from this, but in the in the general scale? What implications are you seeing on conservation there? I think um, we've seen the same here. Certainly, um, you know, our zoos 
have uh, play a big role in conservation in Australia. And, you know, certainly they've lost a lot of revenue as a result of not having international tourists. It's the same for any ecotourism venture. So I think we've, we've all suffered as a result. Um, I think a lot of local people are getting more interested in conservation though. So things like tree planting days, it's phenomenal the number of people who, who turn up to plant trees. Um, so I think at a local level, there's actually more interest in conservation. So there, there may be some trade-offs there. Well, let, let, let's speak on that one a little bit. You know, you, you spoke about the fragmentation and the lack of connectivity, right? So, so one of the things we discuss and debate a lot is really how can we help create connectivity, at least through land patches. In fact, the WNPS has just established a land trust and we are trying to work with different parties to help us fund that so that we can pick up, you know, small blocks of land and, you know, try to create corridors. But the typical uh, tree planting exercise simply looks at isolation, isolated um, space or location and, you know, takes that step. So, uh, is there any thought for orchestrating that from a conservation perspective in the country or do we leave it to the local communities and hope this uh, twain shall meet at some point? No, more and more some science is entering into the tree planting aspect of it. So we're looking at, um, you know, creating uh, cost surfaces in you know spatial GIS so we can see where is it going to be most beneficial to create those corridors and, and not just for koalas it's for a whole range of species yeah. so a number of local councils are doing that and engaging with um, consultants or, or scientists to try to determine where it's actually best to plant trees and then direct those enthusiastic communities to plant trees in those locations. And often they, they will try to support the, you know, the funding for um, providing the trees and the, um, you know, the tree protectors to plant them into as well. So let, let me ask, let me throw you a different question from WNPS. You know, are there any opportunities to partner where we can bring some of that technical knowledge to be dispersed in country here through any partnership programs or things because you know the cost of doing and gaining that knowledge is uh, so exorbitant uh, do these communities and scientists think of the partners partnering beyond their shores in any form i think that's a wonderful idea and and i think that at deacon we're already trying to establish yes. some links with you yes, and are. um to and i certainly would love to come to sri lanka and um you know view some of these issues that you have there and and talk more about it because i think you know we we bring different perspectives and different ideas and i think by collaborating like that we actually end up with better outcomes we learn from you and you learn from us as well yeah um, so um, what are what are some good success stories that are talked about in Australia on some of these fronts because um, you know here the, 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 like you said there's a lot of emotive action uh, and emotive uh, reaction, which can, you know, easily get either political or violent or both. Uh, but the, the, the data keeps staring us in the face with, you know, three, four hundred human deaths and three, four hundred elephant deaths each year rising. Uh, the numbers just keep getting worse by the day. Uh, but the, the willingness to take some concrete steps is often a challenge. So. Um, any success stories that uh, you want to kind of just leave on the table for us? Oh, I think there's probably a lot of success stories, certainly success in terms of bringing some animals back from the brink of extinction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in one of your latest seminars, Anthony Randall is going to, to speak to you about one of the programs he's involved with. Yes, um, I think I saw Anthony on the call. Yeah, I think I can see him there. <laughs> Chime in right, if you would right. like, Anthony. 
<laughs> but no, I think that there's actually a lot of success stories. Um, and, and some of them don't really go that well publicized just because maybe they're animals that we don't consider iconic or, um, you know, people don't care about them so much. How, how do you, um, how do you tackle the communication piece? Any tips and tricks on, you know, uh, doing better on that piece to help galvanize media better or to focus uh, storytelling better? Is there something we can learn from you? Um, I'm not sure that I've got any real advice on that. Um, you know, I think I think some people and, and I'm I, I tend to struggle a little bit with the social media side of things, but some people are very good at putting their scientific arguments into social media. And I think we actually need to use social media a lot more than what we do. And because, you know, it's, it's so easy for mistruths to get propagated on social media. So, you know, maybe we should be learning from other groups, some of our, you know, the animal rights groups, perhaps compassionate conservation, they seem to be very good at marketing themselves and marketing their messages. So as scientists, you know, I, I grew up with my head in a book, not talking to people, not, you know, trying to come up with my one bite of information that was going to sell a story. So as a scientist, I don't think I'm a particularly good communicator. And I think we, we probably all need to become better communicators to, to tell our stories and to really put, just put some facts into the debate. Right. On, on, a, on a program like this, and when you're doing translocation, how much effort and energy goes into the studying of the impact on other species? Because, uh, and you know, depending on, obviously depending on which species being translocated, that aspect could become a lot more complex. So how does that work in these scenarios? So for koalas, the understanding is we're translocating them generally in quite low numbers. They're sterilized, so they're not going to breed where they're released. It's kind of like putting them in a retirement home and you know just letting them die out their days in a new habitat. So the thought is because they're at such low densities, they're probably not having an impact on other species in those habitats. That's that's the thinking. Right. And uh, so if, if the case were to be for translocating without sterilization, would that be something which is not recommended based on what you have seen so far? So it's actually interesting with... Um, for overabundant issues, I would not recommend translocating um, fertile animals. However, the northern states are now looking to us in the south for some advice on translocations because they're in the situation where they actually want to um, re-establish koalas in some areas. So areas where koalas have disappeared from, perhaps due to developments or um, some other impact, where now they're saying, right, this is a suitable area, let's now move koalas into it and establish a breeding population. So there are some instances where relocating fertile animals is probably um, something that could be done there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of debate on that and a lot of consideration of what the flow on impacts might be. So it's, they're not going to be decisions that are taken lightly. How, how does uh, the whole notion of translocation work if you were to apply it across geography. So right now the conversation, I guess, in this case has simply still been, it is still pretty diverse, but within one land block. Are there, you know, what's the thinking of international uh, translocations? Is that uh, something that researchers do not recommend at all? Or? Yeah, so, so for koalas, um, just because of their very specific food tree preferences, um, we recommend 
more local translocation than not. Um, translocating interstate certainly wouldn't work just because our koalas in the south aren't well suited to the warmer temperatures in the north. So remember, there's a lot of variation in koalas from north to south, even though it's one species, the southern koalas would not deal well with conditions in the north. Um, you, you touched on it earlier, but if you can just share a little bit, you know, how serious is climate change impacting uh, some of them or is that not as bad as this issue? Is this the bigger problem or is climate change, you know, complicating it a lot further or? So, so climate change is a massive factor for koalas and it's something that is really likely to hasten that decline that's happening in the north. So it's quite possible that without actions to protect koalas in the northern states to stop development where there's their key strongholds, that koalas will only occur in the southern states. So we really need to protect our populations here. We need to not consider them like they're pest animals. We need to really think about, well, these might be the koalas of the future. So we need to think about genetic diversity. We need to think about building some resilience into habitats as well as the koala populations themselves. Um, but yeah, I think climate change is, is the big, is going to be a big problem for koalas. It already is. I mean, and we've seen, you know, the bushfires we've seen in recent years, it's, you know, they can so quickly wipe out an entire population. Yeah, some of those are pretty nasty from everything we've seen and heard. So, yeah, sorry about that. We, we, we do feel when we see all that, it's, it looks terrible. Um, yeah. So, um, you, you touched on this earlier. Talk to us a little bit about the natural predators for koalas. And, uh, you know, has there been any change in that dynamic over the years which have contributed to these equations? Or is it more the koalas and the other issues themselves, which are the real problem? Yeah, predators, I don't think really factor into it so much. Um, their two main predators are wedgetail eagles. So wedgetail eagles will take joeys. And I've actually seen this, I've witnessed this happening um, where it swoops in, grabs the joey off the mother's back and that's it. And the other one is dogs. So we do have, um, our native dingo, which in the past probably, um, you know, took some koalas, um, probably not many. I mean, koalas are spending most of their time in the treetops. So unless they're crossing large open expanses, they're unlikely to be taken. So these days, dogs can um, impact on koalas, especially up in the north. We've, there was one, um, study that showed it was one dog took you know something like 100 koalas out of a population um, it, it had quite a big impact these koalas were all being tracked so um, they could work out what the fate of the koalas were um, down here in the south it's probably mostly around urban areas and we, we are seeing declines of koalas in urban areas and that's a result of, of dogs, disturbance, um, being hit by cars, those types of things. Okay. Um, so th this next question will be controversial and not linked totally with the koalas, but in some scenarios, you know, people have toyed around and we've seen it in the plant world as well. People have toyed around with introducing a species to control a species, right? Uh, how is that seen in the scientific uh, world? Uh, and I'm here not necessarily referring to the koala question, but the broader question of, you know, is one of the answers, uh, is science also pushing people to introduce a predator or a plant to control, you know, is that still uh, uh, anything very much or is it moving out of fashion or? 
Oh, it's definitely not moving out of fashion. It's something that's promoted quite a lot. And there, there have been some amazing success stories. If you look at the, the story of Yellowstone and the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone, and it took a lot for that to happen, to bring that about a lot of debate as to whether it was the right thing to do. And it certainly had a massive impact on Yellowstone and, and bringing some of those um, habitats um, back from over browsing by other species. And of course, wolves have had negative um, impacts as well, because of course, you know, people with livestock around <laughs> that area, you know, wolves don't stay within Yellowstone, they move. So there's always going to be conflicts, but, but certainly um, trying to bring about more of a balance in a um, ecosystem is something that should always be considered, I think. Is there a way that we can, um, you know, introduce something that maybe was there in the past that may have had um, an impact, you know, may have brought about some kind of balance? I think we should always consider if that's a possibility, but we should also consider the negative consequences of doing that as well. And then really think, you know, is it worth is the, the, are the benefits and costs, you know, is there a balance there? Yeah, well, I guess it's a challenge of the great unknown as well, saying try it and wait 10 years before you know the answer. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a tough one. Well, um, well, you do that, but you also um, can go into these situations with some evidence from other programs. So, you know, you see what happens in say Yellowstone, is it possible then that we can reintroduce, you know, dingoes to some areas of Australia or promote dingoes? And so, so you can go in with an, and make an educated decision. Yeah. Yes, you have to consider it carefully, but you don't have to wait 10, 15 years before you actually do it. Fair enough. Uh, and, and somebody's commented here also saying, you know, uh, there's a role for the scientist as well on the social media angle because there's, you know, so much which, you know, there's complaining and stating and all kinds of things. And we need probably a bit more fact-based things coming out on social media as well because that can ground some of these conversations a lot more. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, I'm going to fire just one or two more questions. I know we are almost up for time. Um in the in these contexts, I'm, I'm guessing from what I heard so far that much of this work is probably funded largely by government. Uh, but irrespective whether it was government or not, um, you know, what kind of economic models or economic approaches do they use to put a price tag on some of these things to say, yeah, you know, if we can manage to balance this population, control this by spending anything up to the tune of X, that seems a good thing. You know, are there, are there you know, how, how does that process happen? Yeah, there's actually a, a lot of um, economics now in wildlife management. And there, there are various methods of putting a value on a species. So whether that's through um, looking at the amount of uh, revenue a species generates through tourism, or asking people how much they think something is worth or, or whether looking at people's behaviors and, and, and working out a cost from that. So I think I'm not an economist, but there's certainly ways that we could look at economic models to determine whether the expenditure is actually worth it. Uh, right now, we are having some fun and games trying to do that exercise for one of our iconic species because we are trying to do some work around the leopards. We've seen some hugely increased uh, incidence of uh, snaring of leopards, especially in the hill country in Sri Lanka. But uh, the second part of the fun and games, I, I guess, comes when we, even if we were to do that calculation and put a price tag, uh, who's going to put, uh, foot the bill? I guess that's where the challenging part comes in. And uh, what we've seen is that, you know, some of the communities who actually benefit from them are not necessarily as uh, excited about wanting to give back. So we've seen 
few great examples of corporates in the country and we work closely with some of them who actually give back uh, as well as they take out but the vast majority of people and communities and institutions and uh, businesses uh, prefer to do more of the taking and less of the giving yeah I, I think that's a worldwide problem isn't it with you know who funds these types of programs and conservation dollars just seem to be in short supply wherever you go. Yeah, yeah, very true. Uh, so any last uh, thoughts, comments for us that you'd like to leave behind? Any suggestions for, you know, groups like us, uh, both from the Sri Lankan uh, community who deal on the iconic species side with both the elephants and the leopards as uh, probably the two top of mind uh, topics but also even for an association like WNPS on anything that you've seen over there that we could do either newly or better. I, I think what you're doing is absolutely wonderful. And, you know, I wish we actually, I think we could learn from you and start, you know, do, do something similar over here where we, you know, provide opportunities to communicate and, um, you know, guest speakers, and I, I just thank you for the opportunity of being here tonight. It's our pleasure, and like you said, you know, we, we are reaching out to the university and uh, WNPS in the recent years has been building and continuing to work on building more international links. So we're really, really happy that uh, we had this opportunity and uh, we look forward to, you know, continuing to engage as well as uh, hopefully uh, if all goes well, uh, we never know. We might see you at our doorstep and, you know, yeah. we'd love to be sharing uh, some good Sri Lankan tea from Dilma, who's one of our great sponsors. And we could be having a conversation on, you know, furthering some of the knowledge sharing. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us at WNPS. And uh, let me also thank the Nations Trust Bank, who's been our longstanding partner in this series. And thanks to the hundreds of people who were connecting both on zoom and on facebook today and uh, usually we have reports and questions after and uh, many topics and uh, actions follow so um, stay safe stay healthy and uh, please do continue this wonderful uh, work you're doing it's a great uh, leading example and i know you inspired many many researchers judging from all the work and all the write-ups i've seen of you uh, on social media so it's been our pleasure having you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you very much. And thanks again to the WNPS team for all the background work in putting this together. So we'll see you on another talk in a month's time. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye.